Good morning, ladies. Sorry Good for morning. my delay. Sorry about that. I had to fix breakfast. We ran out of coffee. Had to go down the street, get my coffee. <laughs> gotta so I can, get the coffee. Gotta have my mug, just like y'all see. Y'all got your mug. I gotta have my mug too. Yeah. I don't <laughs> see. I knew I had to. I know I had to get my coffee. I didn't want to be delayed. Uh, be left out. Right. Good morning, everyone. We are here with a discussion panel about post-COVID returning back to work. We have two dentists here um, and two hygienists. India Chance is um, a business owner from Learn to Prevent. It is an infection control and compliance company. We have Dr. Kathy Cook. She is here and she is a dentist. Also, Dr. Darwin Hayes. He is a dentist and the dental director in New Jersey. So good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So how excited are we to be here with two dentists, passionate dentists, two hygienists who are very passionate. We're here to pretty much spread positivity and give you guys some information on um, a couple of questions and a couple of things that people have been seeing. Um, this is our first week. This is Saturday. This is our first week seeing everybody go back to work. Anxiety is high. People have questions and we're just here um, to deliver that information to you. So, um, India, I'll go ahead and let you formally introduce yourself and like tell us what we should know. Okay. Well, my name is India Chance. So I uh, am a compliance consultant at Learn to Prevent, and we focus on infection control and OSHA specifically in the dental community. I am a dental hygienist, so it does give me a little bit of experience. I think I'm going on my 26th year in dentistry, so I've had a little bit of experience under my belt. And um, I'm just glad to be here. Uh, you know, I'm happy to be with other dental professionals that are passionate about this and passionate about dentistry. And I just don't even know where to begin. I mean, if, if, if there is a specific topic you want to get started on or question that somebody had, we can get started. Yeah. So um, the biggest question is, I think a lot of uh, professionals and a lot of um, healthcare providers are concerned and confused about what is the difference between the ADA recommendations in the CDC guidelines and who we should be following um, when it comes to returning to work and treating patients. Got it. So one of the things that we need to, uh, I guess I'll start there, is that um, kind of giving a quick overview of what each organization does. So then that way it can kind of give you a better idea of who you're supposed to be paying attention to. And so um, OSHA deals with employee safety. They are a legal entity. So they present legislation to the, you know, to Congress. And if Congress passes it, then it becomes a mandate. So there are a lot of OSHA mandates that have applied to dentistry for years. One of those being the bloodborne pathogen standard. There's some other standards <clears throat> so that's OSHA, their employee safety, and their legal entity. So what they say goes, if it's, if it's a mandate. Then you have the CDC. They're not a legal agency. What they are is a department in the government where they collect data and they form recommendations for all types of stuff. Their focus is, it's a national focus on uh, public health and safety. So they focus on patient safety. And what they do is they present this data and then legal entities like OSHA will take those recommendations and they'll create laws. So the CDC is very important because it guides the laws that we have. Um, and then ADA, just like the ADHA, is a professional organization. So they're nonprofit and they are there to serve the membership. So ADA Obviously, you have to be a dentist in order to be a member. And so they're not necessarily a legal entity. They're a professional organization where people pay membership dues, just like the ADHA. However, they do part of their responsibility and their mission is to serve at the pleasure of their membership. So they do give guidance. They give guidelines as far as um, they kind of give advice, really, is what it is. And so they take a lot of their direction from the CDC and OSHA as well, and just like the ADHA does. And so a lot of people have been looking to all different types of, of organizations and stuff like that. Now, the caveat here is that if you're ever involved in an OSHA inspection, uh, OSHA does have a right to take whatever your professional organization has told you to do and look to that and say, well, your professional organization is giving you information. 
that follows CDC or follows our mandates. So you should be paying attention to that too. So they do take that into consideration when they're, if you were to ever experience an OSHA inspection. And so, uh, but legally it's OSHA is the legal entity, CDC kind of guides all of that. Uh, on top of that, you have your state dental board and your health department, and then your governor, govern, um, the mandates from the governor. And so your state, you have to pay, you have to listen first and foremost in a situation like this, whatever your governor mandates, that's what you have to listen to. The health department, that's what you have to listen to in your state. It supersedes the CDC basically. So it's very confusing, but <laughs> uh, you listen to your state, your state governor, your state dental board, and your state OSHA office they're most likely going to be referring to the CDC guidelines. If they tell you to follow the CDC guidelines, then that's what you have to do. That's now a mandate and your CDC is what they're going to look to if you're ever involved in some type of malpractice or inspection, okay? So that's kind of the gist of it. Uh, so it is a good idea if you know what the CDC is saying for the guidelines, you know what your state dental board is saying, you can contact your state dental boards, they're required to tell you, send you information about it. Um, you can call your state OSHA office, they're required to talk to you, and then you can also contact your state health department if you're not sure. But I know it's a lot of different organizations, but unfortunately that, that's kind of the, the order that you have to go in. Right, so we shouldn't just be looking at what the ADA is saying because no. you know, first it was um, non-essential, right? Then it was essential. Then it was cabochon, no cabochon, and then yeah. it was, mm -hmm. and it's going back and forth. And yeah. Dr. Darwin, mm -hmm. um, he just actually sent me something saying like, no more elective uh, procedures <laughs> after everybody just went back and yeah. went with elective procedures. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa! Yeah, and it literally yeah. happened like the first week. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. people started yeah. to come back. What is yeah. it, phase one um, mm -hmm. returning? So well, yeah. you have to keep in mind, you have to keep in mind the fact that, you know, this is, it's, this is a fluid time with regards to regulations, with regards mm -hmm. to responses and, um, uh, and, and, and guidelines. It's, and it's difficult because there hasn't been a time like this since maybe in the 80s when the mm -hmm. AIDS uh, epidemic came out. And just like now, back then, it was like, what do we do? What's this? What's that? Um, so things are always changing. It's always, it's always fluid. Um, and that adds to the confusion. But I think what also adds to the confusion was what uh, she just pointed out was the fact that you have to understand that not all of these organizations or entities that you're, you're getting information from not all of them are regulatory agencies. Regulatory agencies. I say it again, regulatory agencies. <laughs> right. Meaning agencies that you need to follow the regulations for. And um, for each state, it's going to be different. Meaning the, the rules and regulations that come out for each state are going to be different based on your state. But uh, she hit it right on the head. Governor's orders. Department of Health, uh, who's also part of the executive branch of the, of the government, and uh, your state board, your state dental board. Those are the regulatory agencies that um, will, are supposed to be giving guidance mm -hmm. and information that you have to implement. Um, you have to be careful, you know, your dental association or your, your state dental association, uh, like she said, will give advice but doesn't necessarily mean that, that that advice is in compliance with what the regulations say, right? You gotta keep in mind that uh, dental organizations, some uh, dental associations are uh, membership driven. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member of several different ones here in, uh, in my state and um, we pay money to be a member and we want our leadership to make sure that our interests are taking, uh, taken into account. Um, and 
it's the duty and responsibility for the leadership of that organization to voice our concerns, but also advocate, advocate for our positions. And right now, that's what a lot of dental associations across the country are doing. They're advocating for their members and who want to go back to work. Everybody, everybody's ready to go back to work. Um, and they're ready to go back to work, not fully understanding the public health part of what's happening and the dynamic. And some are concerned, but some don't even care because they're ready to go back to work. Their, 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 their thoughts are based off of my business, my profitability, uh, my uh, expenses, and Kathy can, can, Dr. Cook can, can shed some light into that. But one, and then those of us that are in public health, our, our duty and responsibility is the safety of who? The public. And that means patients, that means staff, and that means providers, even the providers as well. They're part of the public of that particular state. So that's, that's why it's so dynamic right now. You've got two entities, kind of two interests going back and forth. You've got the public health uh, uh, component, and then you've got the uh, profitability I have a business, I need to go back to work, I got bills, I got expenses, I need to generate some uh, uh, revenue interest uh, as well. So that's why communication across all of these agencies from the governor, from the Department of Health, from the state board, uh, from uh, national organizations, ADA, ADHA, uh, the CDC, all of it is, is key. And right now, um, even the ADA is, is continuing to push the CDC to make sure that these guidelines that just came out again uh, April 27th are modified, are modified so that they truly represent uh, specific guidelines that can be applied across every state. But unfortunately, this virus is different <laughs> in every state. So there's not going to be uh, a cookie cutter guideline that's going to be able to satisfy each and every dentist, each and every hygienist, each and every uh, dental health care practitioner in all the states because the, the virus is at different stages uh, throughout the state. So communication is, is key amongst all of these agencies as we uh, continue to figure out, and I will say continue to figure out, exactly. because it still hasn't been completely figured out uh, uh, how we go back and open so that it's safe. Safety is key because if it's not safe, uh, patients are not coming back. Personnel, staff are not coming back. And you may have some, some doctors that, that don't want to come back. Some, some practice owners that do want to come back but have some hesitation. So, uh, so I'm, I'm glad we're having this discussion today because it's, it's been a crazy week. It's been a crazy eight weeks. I think it's, um, it's good to hear, you know, from everybody because being that we're all situated in different parts of the country and because it is a fluid process, I think it's important for people that are watching this to take into account. You got to look at what's happening in your state from a public health standpoint. You need to pay attention to your, if it's a rise or if it's a fall in the active infection rates and, and deaths. Um, you need to really pay attention to that. You need to pay attention to what your state board is saying. You need to pay attention to uh, what uh, the CDC is saying. And then you need to pay attention to what do you have in your arsenal to equip you to go back to a safe environment? Mm. So, um, I, I, I think that, um, and now my office is not open yet. Um, I closed my office, I think, um, the last week of March was when I closed my office. We had gone to half days, only seeing emergencies only. We had stopped doing um, cleaning, so the hygienist had already been gone for two weeks. Um, but my office has been closed since then, and I don't know when I'm going to reopen. My, my focus, sole focus has been how do I create a safe environment when mm -hmm. it's time to open? Mm -hmm. um, what I know for sure is I was not going to open in the middle of a rise in the pandemic in my area. And I'm in the South. You know, somebody in South Dakota may have different uh, dynamics than somebody that's in 
Florida versus somebody that's in Texas or California. So I think that state by state, your community specifically, because in each state you got hot spots. There are some areas that have hot spots and some that don't. But I'm looking at what's happening in my community. So my focus has been, okay, when we're ready to get back, what do I need to have in place? And so that's where my focus has been, listening to webinars and, and actually watching people who are going back out there, kind of tweaking what they're doing, whether it's a video that I put out to my patients or it's a practice that's in the office. Um, I have learned a tremendous amount about things I had no knowledge about. Like, I mean, I know that I've used a Sonicare toothbrush forever and it's got this little UV thing that cleans <laughs> my little toothbrush head, right? But that's as much as I know about, you know, maybe the little, the cassette that you see in the nail salon that you pull and I'm always giving them the side eye like, is that <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, but I'm learning a lot about UV mm -hmm. and how it can kill bacteria and contaminants, right? So mm -hmm. I have, uh, just yesterday, I had I set up an installation of, of the UV um, uh, lights in my HVAC at my office. I have acquired standalone HEPA units for each operatory and for the um, uh, lobby, though people will not be sitting in the lobby in my office. I have acquired, I'm in the process of acquiring one of these really fancy helmets you slip your head into looking like a Martian. We're going to look like a Jetson. <laughs> and that's what I'm telling Just get ready. We're going to look like a Jetson. Right. Like, at least I am. Right. Um, you know, we have acquired a little fogger and vital oxide. And that's one of the recommended things from the CDC. So the mm -hmm. things that I am, am, am um, installing or adding to uh, my protection are following CDC guidelines. What the things that they recommend um, I'm going to give patients a mask when they come into my building. We're instituting curbside check-ins. We're using our practice management software to reach out to patients and to explain to them that, you know, when you get here, there's a certain protocol. We're going to do consent forms and we're going to pay for treatment outside the building. Um, when they come in, they're going to be escorted to their dental suite. We're going to begin and commence their treatment and see one patient at a time. And in between patients, we're going to spray that vital oxide which yep. takes only one to two minutes to dry, but uh, it's recommended from the CDC that you give it 10 minutes for efficacy. So we're gonna space those patients apart, 10, 12, 15 minutes, just to ensure that the air is purified. And so between the vital oxide, the, the uh, UV in, in the HVAC and the standalone HEPA units, we wanna make sure we have clean air. Everybody in my office will wear a mask. The business team will probably have on a surgical mask, I've even looked into another webinar showed me where you can have a custom fitted. There's an app that takes a picture of your face that you can send to a lab that creates this, uh, this, this outline of your face that goes over whatever mask that you wear to create a seal all the way around it. Um, business team will be wearing a mask. Everybody else that's in treatment will have on an N95 mask and a surgical mask over it with a face shield and a disposable isolation gown that's discarded after every patient you know um it's a lot of additional steps and every one of those steps has a price tag mm -hmm. every single one of those steps has a price tag and while we're talking about how do we get back to business i know that you know and i want to encourage somebody who's watching this who's watching their bank account just dwindle getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller guys when we get back to work we're going to make the money we, we, we got time to make more money, but we need, we need to be healthy. Our families need to be healthy. Our staff needs to be healthy. Our patients need to be healthy. And we don't want to become epicenters for the spread of this virus. Is this virus going to continue to be with us? Yes, but not at the level that it is right now, not forever. Mm -hmm. And once we get through this storm, we're going to be fine. So I really want to hear from, I want to hear more from the hygienist, what your thoughts are and, and what more specifically some of the other recommendations, maybe something that I haven't mentioned that you believe that we need to be doing. Um, and, and if you've been to work already this week, tell me what that week has been like. What if, what have you encountered? I mean, I know your anxiety has been like way up here because I remember the last week, my mental anguish and my anxiety was higher than it's ever been in my life. And I've been in the military. I've been a single mom. I've been through dental school. <laughs> You've been traumatized, huh? <laughs> Not my own PTSD. <laughs> you know? Nothing, nothing has felt 
the way that it felt in my spirit and in my mind, in my being, the way that it did the last week that I was in my practice. It was a very tough decision to close, but it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what I've been seeing, I'm not back to work yet, but what I have been seeing, the pictures people are posting from going back to work, um, everyone is doing things different. So that is that was the number one red flag. I'm like, wait a minute, I just saw somebody in literally a space suit in gloves and then you see people that just have the face shield the n95 mask in the mask over the n95 mask and i'm like wait okay so what are we doing here so then you get the questions like oh is this mask um i think it's a lot of do-it-yourself things going on that we're seeing which is so confusing because let's face it we can't get the supplies that we need so opening up and going back to work right now i feel like it's going to cost us more it's going to cost more versus us just waiting. Um, I don't know what, what the regulations are and what we should be wearing. I haven't even contacted my office to figure out, do we have the gowns? Um, I've heard hygienists using the same gowns and dentists haven't spraying them down um, or using the same mask. I've heard about that and I'm just like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> like, what, what do you do when you're in that situation? What, you're, you're stuck in an ethical dilemma. Like, okay, am I using the same disposable gown or am I, am I throwing it away. Right. Spraying, the, spraying the gown down with what? Lysol? Lysol. Oh my god. So we're hearing these <laughs> things and we're seeing them. <laughs> People are back at work and they're, yeah, yeah, this is what we're doing. And they're thinking in their mind, this is good. We're spraying it with Lysol and we're just <laughs> airing out and we're just spinning around and then we're good. But it's like, no. And honestly, you know, what the, that's that dentist practice, what they say goes. So if you're hy a hygienist and or a dental assistant and you want your job, you're just going to do whatever they say. At first, in my job, at my job, they were saying, we're going to wipe everything every hour. We're going to go and disinfect everything. Front desk is going to wear gloves and masks. And if you, um, if you are at work, stand six feet between you and the next person. And then I'm just like, well, what about the patients? Like, work right here so like some of the things that they were doing we were just doing them because they told us to do them but did it make sense no and i feel like a lot of people are doing a lot of things and wearing a lot of ppe and take a lot of precautions that are just they're just making up like this is what we have to do yeah, yeah. i've i've seen some things and i'm just like i don't know i don't know who told you that or why we're doing it but well, i you know i think it's important that um and this is where i started my journey that, that before I closed my office, I had already begun to read research articles. I wasn't listening to the news. I wasn't listening to what people said. I started reading for myself. The very first article was, at, it was uh, from an international uh, oral science periodical, uh, peer-reviewed, I don't know if it was peer-reviewed, but it was February 2020, and it was um, out of China. So this was a very in-depth, a research article talking about the the virus itself, what it what it does, you know, what you need to do to protect against it. It it just went into great detail. So I think that my journey began with understanding the virus, mm -hmm. right? Once I began to understand the virus, how it's transmitted, and how to kill it, then that that kind of helped me to tune my ear to things that made sense based on how this virus works. Right. And not getting pulled into, well, this is like the flu. This is like, no, right. no. It, it's, it's not the first coronavirus, but this is the first time we're dealing with this. That's why it's a novel coronavirus. So I would encourage people, you know, do your research, pull an article, um, and, and I'll try to, I think I've sent it to Dr. Darwin. He sent it to me. I don't know. But very early on, that's what I did. And then I began to um, say, okay, well, what makes sense? right? There are a lot of recommendations. Does that tie into how we can be safe from this virus or how we can kill this virus? And that's how I began to develop the protocol. And, and in my office, I probably would be the only one to have that little thing over my head, mm -hmm. but I'll be the only person that interacts with every single patient, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to be with every single patient and I am going to discard that isolation gown. Now, if I had some kind of a fancy UV box that could sterilize it after an hour or four hours or whatever, there is a protocol that says you can reuse things that are in properly um, disinfected in a UV box. Um, but if you don't have a way to do that, the research doesn't say that if you spray it, that you'll kill it 
because then, I mean, it's just too uncertain. I think that we have to really plan ourselves in things that are certain. We certainly won't get the virus if we wash our hands. We certainly won't get the virus if we wear an N95 mask that's fit tested. Fit tested. Fit tested. Fit tested. Fit tested. tested. (laughs) We certainly won't get the virus if we use something to sanitize the air. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that if we strip away the fear, unfortunately, we've been in a climate where there's a lot of fear mongering. Yep. It, yep. And, and, yep. and I'm going to go here for a minute and you don't have to be a believer, but God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a wisdom of love and a sound mind. Mm. Strip away the fear so that you can operate in a sound mind so that you don't instill fear in your staff. Everybody's like, oh my God, calm down. Yes. Calm down. We don't have testing. In my state, they just approved that they're going to have statewide testing available to everybody. That was just yesterday. And hopefully state by state, they'll do the same thing. As dentists, we should push for things like in our offices to have the ability to have rapid test site testing on site Mm -hmm. that we can test the staff and we can test the patients so that we can know what we're dealing with every single day. But until that happens, we do have to take the extra, take the high road, take the extra steps. And it's going to look a little weird, you know, until we level out. So I would say do more instead of less. Um, and, you know, I'm not trying to tell people how to run their practices. I wouldn't do it. But if I were working for somebody else, right, if I were not the owner dentist and I was the associate dentist, I probably would invest in additional isolation gowns. Yes. For my if I didn't feel ethically that there was something that I could wrap myself around, I probably would absorb the cost because some of these decisions are being made because of the cost. I don't know the condition of people's practices. I don't know how many patients they had seen before this or how much of their production is going to drop based on the number of patients you're going to have to limit yourself to. Um, I just believe that if I do it right, I'm going to make the money back. That's what I believe. So yeah. all of my practices are centered around that. And that's key. That's key. That's key. I know for us, uh, I think the, the understanding, the, the key vital point is this. Um, public health leads to ongoing economic health and, 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 and success. Because again, at the, at the end of the day, if people are not healthy or people are fear, uh, fearful and not assured that your office or that the dental health uh, institution or location office is not safe, people are not coming. People are not coming. Mm-hmm. And if people don't come, then we're not able to deliver the oral health care that, that they need, that they want. Mm-hmm. Same, yeah. thing go, same thing goes on the, the personnel side. Mm-hmm. The personnel do not feel that uh, the office or the business is not taking into consideration their safety. They're not coming. <laughs> right. <laughs> They're exactly. not coming back or they're going to be very hesitant coming back. I I know this is not just unique to dentistry right now. This is also in in other industries as well, where people are boycotting and and protesting about going back because they feel uh, that particular company did not, is not protecting them or, or for the food industry that, that we've just realized, I just had some, um, some information about, you know, they're, they're upset that, you know, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people got uh, got the disease. And now they're protesting saying, well, you guys, uh, uh, Mr. Corporation, Mr. ABC Food or uh, XYZ Food, you guys didn't protect us. That's not okay. So, you know, the public health and the perception of being protected and being safe has got to be primary. And this is this is new for for some industries. This is new for... Uh, it shouldn't be new for us in dentistry, right. but you know, uh, the the closer away you are from that type of mentality, um, sometimes the quicker you are to react to want to go back and not necessarily really be able to go back where where it protects everybody. And it's it's a it's a challenging it's a challenging time, especially when it's going to maybe cost more money. Yeah. 
I would agree with that. I was going to um, say in response to you guys that um, one of the things I think, Martel, that you spoke about is you, a lot of these, uh, a lot of dental hygienists or maybe associates or assistants are doing stuff that they don't agree with or it's, they don't, you know, the practice owner didn't put a comprehensive reopen plan in place. And from a legal standpoint, outside of health, <laughs> if you're a licensed professional, yep. you are going to be held responsible. So it doesn't matter. I'm a dental hygienist. I have my own malpractice insurance. And I cannot stress enough that if you are a licensed professional, you should have your own malpractice insurance, okay? Just because you're not the practice owner, do not rely on the practice owner's malpractice insurance because in the event that you're working for someone who has not implemented a comprehensive reopen plan that's following the CDC guidelines or following the state and, or the health department or you know whoever is the governing body in your state, uh, you will be held legally liable as well as the yep. practice owner. I mean, you as the dental hygienist, if you have a license, you uh, are subject to the Dental Practice Act in your state. Um, you are subject to all of the laws. All it takes is one patient. Yep. It doesn't take an outbreak. It takes one patient yep. to say, hey, I saw that they were supposed, you know, they could be chatting innocently with the family member and the family member says, you know, telling the family member about their dental visit and the family member says, well, that's not what they do at my office or they, t you know, or I read, I saw on TV and then it just, the ball goes from there and not to scare anybody into thinking that, you know, you're definitely going to, you know, get in trouble. But if you are not following the CDC guidelines, if your state dental board is telling you that you have to, um, if you do have malpractice insurance, I would encourage everybody to contact them because they have said, most of them have sent out emails to yes. their policyholders that have said, if you are, we will not cover you if you are not following the CDC guidelines. And so that's where, if you're in a situation where you walk into a practice that's not ready, it now becomes a situation where you have to advocate for yourself it becomes an ethical situation, moral situation, and then legal situation. And so that's why Dr. Cook, you know, you got, they're spot on when they're saying, educate yourself on how the disease is spread, educate yourself on the CDC guidelines for yourself, read through the interim guidance that OSHA has put in place, know what your dental board, contact your dental board, know what they're saying that you can and cannot do so that when you do, you know, go back on that first day, if things aren't in place or prior to that, you can have a competent conversation with your practice owner to say, hey, look, this is what's going on. This is what is in print. I'm not worrying about fake news clickbait. I'm not worrying yeah. about what the Facebook groups are saying. I'm telling you what's in writing. I have it here. Here's the link here. You can see for yourself. And then this is what our dental board is saying we have to do. You know, you you will have a leg to stand on. You do not have to just go in there and just do whatever because you need to keep a job. That yeah. is not what this is about. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I think you hit it right on. The end. Communication is 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 key. And I think I was looking at the uh, interim guidelines that the ADHA put out, and that was one of the things that was that uh, that stuck uh, that kind of stood out for me, which was there was a comment about communication and how making sure your offices that you're working at, that there's a, a, a communication circle and opportunity for everybody to be talking about, all right, what's our plan? And I know Dr. Cook has done this because we've, we've talked about it and she's got, she has uh, Zoom calls with her team and everything, but you know, they're, they're looking for leadership. We're all looking for leadership and guidance, but it also starts, from uh, each and every one of us, as far as learning about what's happening, but also communicating with 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 your team or your team members or other and parts of and your inviting team. them into that space. Um, you got to. Forgive me, I've forgotten your name already, but um, India, India, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. uh -huh. but India, somebody like you is an asset to me on my mm -hmm. team. 
that well you, i'm glad you said that because i i'm listening to you describe your office and i'm thinking where does she i was going to ask martel where does she practice because i want to i want to go <laughs> 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 But this should be the norm. That's the yes, that's it should. You are yeah. so right. This should be the norm. So this has right. got to be it the should, norm. Yes. I'm gonna say something. It frees me to have people on my team that bring information that we can discuss. Mm -hmm. And I tell all of them, first of all, it's too much. It's insurmountable amount of information. It's too much for me to process alone. That's why God bless me with a team. You know, between the two offices, there's 15 of us. Mm -hmm. And so as a team, we're navigating this. One, because I need my team to have a buy-in. I don't need to go back and have half of them that want to and half of them that don't. And here's the reality. I'm not going to make anybody come back that's not comfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've got at least one person on my team that has a condition where her immune system is compromised. She was the first person I told her to go home. File mm -hmm. on, we're going to file unemployment for you. Mm -hmm. I, it's, uh, it's too many uncertain things. I, I couldn't stomach it. I couldn't live with myself if something happened. But back to your point, having people on the team that are helping me to research and every week our focus is different based on where we are in this planning and preparation process. So this next week, we're going to be, you know, calling not just the people that are calling in for emergencies, <clears throat> we're calling all of our patients. You know, we just sent out an updated letter this past week. We've been working on a script on how they're going to do that. We're standing up telehealth 100% next week. And I'm working on making a video and creating the content for that video so that I can tell people, hey, this is what you can expect when you get to our office. Mm -hmm. So that when we begin to make appointments, that we can direct people to the website and say, take a look at this video. It'll tell you what to expect. And mm -hmm. everybody inside the office now is on the same page, right? We all are doing the same things because I cannot have anybody on my team that's scared. Right. I can't have anybody on my team that's uninformed mm -hmm. because I don't need robots. I need people to think it through because the things that I don't see tell me. They need to be, we all need to be eyes and ears together and say, hey, Dr. Cook, you know what? This is working, but I think this will work better. And somebody say, you know what? I saw this and this seems more efficient. So you know what, um, I, if it's okay, can we share? Because I was telling somebody how we did this and they really liked how it becomes a community effort. Mm -hmm. And it, your first community is your team. So I, I think you should feel empowered when you take your, your CEO, whoever's in charge, the information. One, they see that you have a buy-in, that you have an interest, that you really, you want to make this a successful venture. Um, so be empowered that that's a great position, but educate yourself. Mm -hmm. Know what you need to do. Even if you got questions, write those down. Mm -hmm. Take them. We got. Mm -hmm. I have questions. Let's say, hey guys, you know, I, I, I've read this five times. What do y'all think? And mm -hmm. we begin to chop it up, and we begin to chat. And so, um, I'm grateful. I have an amazing team now, um, and I think that my hygienist said to me more than once, "I'm so glad you're not rushing to get back to the office." Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it's time yet. Now I'm mm -hmm. hoping rush, rush, no. rush for what? Rush to get sick. <laughs> rush to sit and well, sit around I mean, because I don't know that that not, many patients are going to rush back either. Let's not, yeah, well, there you go. That's the point. Let's yeah. not negate the uh, financial side of this. Okay? Yeah. I mean, because we've been having this conversation exclusive, you know, excluding that element. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a real element. It the is. people that are working at the grocery stores, the people that are still in produce picking the fruit that we go to the grocery store to buy, the people that showed up at that chicken plant where they got sick, all those people needed their jobs. The mm -hmm. frontline people who just didn't have a choice, they needed that job with the low paying wages that they had to feed their families. Some people still have not received their unemployment checks. Mm -hmm. So we have to be realistic and compassionate from that perspective as well, because I didn't beat my colleagues up when they decided to go back to work. I mm -hmm. just said, listen, be careful. Yeah. I mean, be careful because I would hate for something to happen to you. Mm -hmm. One of my mm -hmm. team members went to take her daughter to the dentist one day this week. She didn't tell us until the end of the conversation which provider she was going to. And I said, because she was talking about the protocol, how they called her, what they said to her, how they were doing consent forms. And I said, well, that's all useful information. So at the end of that, I said, which provider is she going to see? She's going to see her pediatrician. She says, no, she's going to see the dentist. I said, you taking your baby to the dentist? The first week that they decide to go back, 
in right. our community. I right. got on the phone because we were in a Zoom meeting and you know she hit me up one on one and I said, listen, I didn't mean to, you know, embarrass you. I just I care about you and I really think that maybe wait. Because mm-hmm. they're not even gonna let you go in with her. Mm-hmm. Your daughter doesn't know You're right. that. She's twelve mm-hmm. years old. Mm-hmm. You can't go mm-hmm. in with her. I mm-hmm. just don't think it's safe. I said, and as a dentist, I'm telling you, don't take your baby to this. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you guys mentioned um, about, I think it's Dr. Darwin, about leadership. And I think it's not just leadership for the team. It's also going to be, we need to present ourselves as leaders for our patients because they're going to be looking to us uh, for questions. You know, anytime something's going on in the news, they'll come in and they'll say, what do you think about this? You know, did you hear about this? And now with more and more news stories uh, featuring focused on dentistry and the whole aerosols and everything, we need to really be equipped with information that we can competently have a conversation and give them uh, legit information, not something that you heard from somebody else or whatever. And so that's why we need to really make sure. I mean, at the end of the day, we're healthcare providers. So we should be knowledgeable on all of this. We should be knowledgeable on how the disease is transmitted. We should be knowledgeable on, you know, all the different aspects of you know, how long does it stay in the air? I'm sure you're going to get questions about that. Like all this different stuff, they're going to be looking to us because we're healthcare providers. They want, they expect us to know. And so, you know, it's a really just a good idea to make sure that we know. The other thing I wanted to mention is too, and um, I think Dr. Cook, you mentioned that the, the, the financial aspect of this, that, you know, a lot of dental practice owners are going back because of the financial aspect and whether they have to or, you know, or not. Um, And to the hygienists and the dental assistants and team members who are asking for all of this different type of PPE and equipment and everything, you have to keep in mind, and you said, Dr. Cook, that there's a price tag to every single thing that you're doing. And so I would encourage those team members that if you your practice owner doesn't have a particular piece of equipment that you really want or is starting to become a non-negotiable for you do some research on the cost do some research on how it will you know is it part of the guidelines that you're supposed to have it um do some research on you know, what does it mean if you have that piece of equipment and, you know, so that way you can go into your practice owner, have all of that information because some of, some of the practice owners are strictly about the business side of this whole thing. They're not super concerned about the public health side and all of that kind of thing. And so you want to be able to have a business conversation with your practice owner so that you can advocate for yourself uh, if you need that piece of equipment and, and, and really give them some research to why on the public, on the health side of why this is good that we have this piece of equipment. I think there's a lot of different things that you're going to have to kind of learn and and do that maybe you haven't been used to doing in the past but we have to understand that everybody has a different type of skin in this game and so every role in the office you know you have the practice owner who's the employer but they're also a clinician so they have two things that they have to juggle and then you have the hygienist who's a provider and maybe they work on commission maybe they don't I mean everybody you know then you have the front desk you have the dental assistant and so everybody has a different perspective and so the more that you know the better I think it's going to be when you return back uh, to work so but yeah, I'm just glad, but I'm, I'm serious, Dr. Cook. I want to know where you're <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the third time she did that. Time I said <laughs> she, that. I might be doing some relocation oh. right now. Thanks for inviting In, me on here. <laughs> India, I had a question. I feel like this is the biggest question. Like, yeah. what are we supposed to be, um, what does it look like going back to work? What are we supposed to be wearing? What are we supposed to be doing? Um, and then what do we need to be careful about when it comes to social media? Um, and then for the pricing, you know, I just learned that there are some insurance companies reimbursing um, mm-hmm. the PPE cost. So how do um, you charge for um, that? Yeah, um, some. Right. It's like um, three. It's like three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, so as far as what you're supposed to be wearing when you go back, you need to go, again, this goes back to what is your dental board saying that you have to follow? 
So we know we have to follow OSHA because OSHA is in every single state. It's federally mandated. And so OSHA does have PPE requirements as part of the bloodborne pathogen standard that has not changed. That's been in effect since the HIV epidemic in the 80s. So in the bloodborne pathogen standard are requirements for what we're supposed to be wearing regarding PPE. Now, because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. OSHA has added guidance. It's not part of a mandate, but it's guidance. And um, you are strongly urged to follow this guidance because your dental boards and your health departments are looking at that guidance. Your state OSHA board, I'm sorry, your state OSHA office is looking at that guidance. Um, and they, it, during this time, they are acknowledging that as that's what we're supposed to be doing. So that's OSHA. CDC now has a plethora of information on what you need to be wearing. They've even broken it down on their website per piece. So you can literally click each piece of personal protective equipment. It will give you a guideline for the gowns. It will give you a guideline for protective eyewear, for face masks, uh, for, I mean, it's, it's face um, <clears throat> yeah, face shield during this time. Uh, they also, for dental practice, well, it's really more for the hospitals, but dental, I've been encouraging dental practice owners to use it. It's called a PPE burn rate calculator. And so you can load in, it's an Excel spreadsheet. They've already set it up. You can load in all of your PPE and it'll give you a burn rate uh, of, you know, how long your PPE will last. So it helps you to, with a little bit of financial uh, aspect there. So in my state and pretty much everybody's state right now, um, everybody is deferring to the CDC. So my state dental board late last night because there was some issues going on. So it's been, and I'm in Maryland. So there's been a little. Oh, you're in Maryland. <laughs> there's oh. been a little. Oh, we're going to oh, we, oh, going it's on really going to get okay? good now. Oh. Yeah, there's some stuff been going on here. Yeah. So they sent out a, a letter last night. Late uh -huh. last night. I'm like, this is Friday night. What's going that, on? That's the, but um, that's the second letter. They sent a letter out yes, on Thursday. They sent too. a letter out on Thursday. We got mm -hmm. another one last night at 1021 to be exact p.m. Uh, and so they adamantly stated that we are supposed to be following the CDC. So as far as what you should be wearing when you re-enter, when you go back into your dental practice, you have to uh, follow what your state dental board is saying. And in my state, it's the CDC. They are adamant about that. They have things bolded in this letter. It's like, it's a page and a half, but they are very clear on what we are supposed to be doing. And so for me in my state, I have to follow what the CDC is saying. Dentists were told in this letter that they have to follow what the CDC is saying regarding the type of environment that me as a dental hygienist, what I'm supposed to walk into. Yeah. And they included us, on, they included the dental hygienist because we're licensed in on this letter so that we know what we are supposed to be walking into. If we are not walking into that, then I personally have a choice. What am I going to do? Am not I gonna walk into work. Not walk into work? <laughs> am I going to walk into work? Am I going to make a phone call to the dental board? Like, what am I going to do? So, um, but it's very clear on what I'm supposed to be wearing when I walk in. So there, that's that as far as, um, and that's what I'm going to recommend. I'm going to yeah. tell everybody, contact your dental board. They regulate the Dental Practice Act and the laws in your state. It affects right. your license, right. okay? So you need, if you don't know, you need to reach out to somebody and call them because at the end of the day, that is who is going to determine if anything happens legally, okay? Because See, we're not to that phase yet because we haven't reopened, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. so uh, you contact your dental board. That is what they're there for. They are there to, sh you are a licensed dental professional. You are allowed to contact them to find out what you're supposed to be doing. And you're allowed to have it in writing. That's another thing. You are allowed to request from your dental board a letter stating what are you supposed to be doing. Yeah. So that way you have it in writing. I just wanted to add another thing that is in writing and that's unique to Maryland is they have also incorporated uh, a self-certification letter that all yes. practices have to do. Now, yeah. this is, this is uh, kind of new in the sense that uh, some of the other state boards and state health departments uh, that have 
collaborated in, in making guidelines for dentistry, um, this is something different than I've seen. And I yeah. know they've got something different in Alaska, which I wanted to share with everybody too. But one of the things I thought was really good um, was this self-certification letter, mm -hmm. which, uh, which is required that whoever the managing authority is at that dental facility or that dental office or that dental center, that they have to write a letter on their letterhead, on the company letterhead, and send it via email to the, the Maryland Department of Health and the, health the dental board, mm -hmm. yeah, the health department, mm -hmm. stating mm -hmm. that all the above conditions that, are, that were listed on the regulations uh, for resuming elective and non-urgent medical and dental care have been met prior to Opening. resuming mm -hmm. uh, operations. So not only did the offices have to write that letter saying, yep, we got everything, we got enough. I think in Maryland is a seven day supply of PPE. Yes. Mm -hmm. Was required. Yep, mm -hmm. we got that, we got this, we got protocols in place, yep, yep, yep. And then you are certifying saying that you're doing that. The second part was now that you've got that letter and you sent it to the, the uh, regulatory agency, now you have to post that letter in the office prominently Mm -hmm. so that uh, uh, mm -hmm. for the attention of the patients and for the staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I, I, I can tell you, I'm sure there's going to be some people that are, um, <laughs> that, Dr. That are Darwin, this that. phone right here, okay? <laughs> when, that, <laughs> when that came out, the phone did not stop. I mean, I, mo pretty much most of my clients are in Maryland, and that was one of the yes. biggest things but, because, you know, but the good thing is, it's holding people accountable. accountable. Yes, There has to be some type of oversight. In exactly. dentistry, we are very used to no oversight or and loose oversight. It's kind of loose yep. oversight. Yep. It's not like our medical friends and colleagues who, you know, a lot of these private, smaller medical offices are owned by larger uh, medical companies. And they have, you know, it's like a franchise kind of setup. Really, yep. they, they have rules that they have to abide by, even though they're small private and similar to DSOs and stuff like that, depending on which one you're with. But a lot of dental offices, you know, they're privately owned sole proprietors. So uh, this is really pulling people to the carpet to say, and it's also legally holding you accountable. Uh, it's really, re so it is not just the governor says open and then you go in the next day and turn the lights on. Can't be, it's, there's, Maryland has really, they've really put in something. Well, we're, we're the state, we're one of the states that had the outbreak at the chicken plant. And um, we had, um, I personally live in a county which has been a hot spot. There's like three counties that have been hot spots. So my county, county next to us, and then there's another one. Um, so we've had a lot going on here in Maryland. And mm -hmm. so I think that they're just, really um trying to make sure everything all their ducks are in a row but yeah. you know so, so that's that's uh, some great guidance from maryland and i think other states will look into the other state that had uh, a very interesting guidance was alaska and i don't know if you all heard about alaska but alaska was one of the states uh through the governor and the dental board that went back two weeks ago and then just last week, the governor kind of switched it around as far as or the governor in conjunction with the Department of Health and the board switched it around and made some more specific guidelines as relates to healthcare professionals. And one of the things that was required <clears throat> that was put into the emergency regulations was the fact that in order for medical practices, dental practices, healthcare practices to go back, Patients that were coming in for appointments had to have a test within 48 hours of that appointment. Wow. And they have to be negative, of course, right? Yeah. Uproar. It's so hot in, in Alaska right now, the ice is melting. I mean, people are upset. <laughs> they are upset because, because of the fear that it's going to basically shut down dentistry. Mm -hmm. And I understand the concern because it's like, well, 
if the whole you, you, uh, United States is having problems with testing, getting testing kits, how are we going <laughs> to, how are we right. going to access to, to testing? Um, granted, you know, Alaska, I think is one of the states that's, that's at a total opposite end of the curve with regards to this pandemic. Um, but on a public health uh, perspective, that's the only way that we're really going to be able to, to, to reopen with a level of confidence and a level of safety, knowing that the people that are coming in, our patients that we service, uh, are, are negative, that our staff is negative, that the providers are negative, right? And it's unfortunately, it's gonna be, have to be a, an ongoing process because most patients don't just have one appointment. Right, oh right. God. So, so this, whole, <laughs> this, whole, this whole notion of testing and having access to testing and allowing dentists. That's what I was just going to ask you. Is it part of their Dental Practice Act to-, to Allowing to dentists tests? to be able to prescribe and or yeah. uh, administer the test. Yeah. In some states, it's very clear. Dentists are not authorized to do the right. test. Right. Which right. is ludicrous. Ludicrous, yeah. as Mike Tyson would say. Ludicrous. Yeah. Ludicrous. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. It makes yeah. no. It makes no sense. Yeah. We yeah. are. We, this is our area. We we've been trained through our, our, our coder accredited programs, both dentists and hygienists, mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to uh, oral health, but at, but also as it relates to uh, things that uh, just general overall health as well. And um, and to say that dentists are not qualified or are not essential in this effort to increase testing is uh, another challenge that many states are having with regards to this whole pandemic. This is an opportunity uh, for, for us in dentistry to really, really be advocate for ourselves, um, especially as it relates to this pandemic, because there's many, many decisions being made uh, uh, for us and we're not collectively here together uh, to at the table to to make make those decisions and to give give feedback um, regarding how dentistry also fits in and and that's the problem we've been the half stepchild of medicine for 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 so long that we're just not even thought of it's just kind of mm -hmm. like dentistry well no y'all not doctors y'all not y'all not this y'all don't have anything to do with with what we're talking about which is the reason why in some states there is no allocation of PPE right. for dentists. There is right. no allocation of testing for dentists or, or even collaborating with dentists who could provide testing. Mm -hmm. many, many states, I know here in the tri-state area of, uh, of, of New Jersey, New York, and uh, Connecticut, and also Pennsylvania, um, Many of the governors have have put on uh, put on their battle plan the fact of the fact um, the fact that there's not enough testing done, and that I know uh, in New Jersey uh, last week they were at seven thousand tests a day, but they needed to be at like seventy thousand tests a day to really yeah. be able to um, control or at least yeah. have more data. That's ten times as as much, right? Yeah. So not only is there a shortage of tests and ingredients that make up the test, but there's a shortage of providers that can mm -hmm. administer the test. This is what we do. Right, right. <laughs> and it's crazy because in most um, like metropolitan areas, one third of the medical care that's delivered is delivered by a dentist. And so that's the stat. So can you imagine how many tests could have gotten done Absolutely. if dentists were allowed to do them? Well, I think that we're going to move into a time, at least I hope, that that is going to become a new standard. Yeah. That we're going to yeah. press on people the mm -hmm. valuable role that we play in this overall process mm -hmm. because what we know is that it's here. Yeah. It's here to stay. And if we become the triage doc mm -hmm. um, for this virus every time that we see somebody, then we can help to delineate, you know, the people that are negative and people that are positive and help to direct them with whatever protocol is necessary for them. It, and it also protects everybody, helps to, to eliminate the spread of the virus. Um, yeah. My whole team and I went and got tested mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago. We went to the public health department 
and it was a drive through testing thing and you know everybody came back negative but the people that administered the test were not more trained than anybody on my team right yeah i think yeah. Right, in my office not just right. me yeah. I, it's not just the dentist i think any um oral health care provider is is certified and 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 has the experience to conduct the test and that we need to continue to push 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 yeah. this together we need to work and push for on-site yeah. method testing yeah yeah on-site absolutely right yeah the testing and and help to create the the collaboration and the partnership between those offices and the mm-hmm. laboratories because the truth is dr hayes and india and martel when those people get those tests within 48 hours, it's just a snapshot in that moment. Right. Mm-hmm. It, it's not valid by the time that they get to us. So I don't right. even to warm up to that idea. Right. I, you know, that's, that doesn't make sense based on what I've read. Exactly. Right. right? And, and, and especially if people are just uh, <laughs> being knuckleheads, as the governor of New Jersey puts, and, and still not practicing social distancing. Mm-hmm. I mean, <clears throat> Well, let's let's have a real conversation. If we can segue into just what is really happening in communities all over the country. For the 13 states where the governors have loosened the restrictions, right? This past weekend, I'm not even talking about this weekend, last weekend, you had people out in the parks, people on the beach, people <laughs> had pool parties, people, people were having parking lot parties. They were yes. just happy to be out of the house and, and as much as they were, you know, initially thought that they were going to exercise some social distancing. That's not what happened. People mm-hmm. went to the nail salon. People went to the hair salon. People went to the tattoo parlors. People are, you know, they've even taken up the little blue tape on the floors in the grocery stores. They have lessened just a little bit. People are out. There was a traffic jam in Atlanta last Saturday. Oh, wow. A traffic wow. jam on a Saturday. Wow. What I'm saying is people are human. Mm-hmm. They are tired. They, they are ready to get back to a sense of normalcy. They are confused by the leadership in our states and in our country, and they will listen and believe anything. Yeah. And because of the, 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 we are gonna see a, a spike in the transmission of this virus, we have to be ever so mindful that we have to be the leaders, mm-hmm. we have to be the loudest voice, we have to have the most reason, but we have to have the most information. We, we have to tell them, we got to put together a plan and tell people, this is what you need to be doing. This mm-hmm. is what we need to be pushing for. And so it's, it's forums like this, right? Because I took some notes. I learned something about the PPE burn rate. You know, I, I, <laughs> that's going to become a part of what I do. Mm-hmm. I want to learn as much as I can, but we got to encourage people, do not fall for the opioid. Don't fall. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because if you do, you'd be okie dead. Yeah, <laughs> I think this okay. is an opportunity, too, for dentistry to really shine if we present back to our offices in the right way with everything in order like you're doing, Dr. Cook. I mean, this is really an opportunity for dentistry to be elevated if it's done the right way uh, so that we can start to be on these at the state level and the legislate in, involved more in the legislation than we already are or we can be on these advisory boards you know i've watched several videos over this whole time where uh dental associations have been interviewing the governors and different things and not one dentist is on any of the advisory boards in for that state and so I've shared this with some of my dentist colleagues, my friends, right? And they're like, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. And I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't like get you upset that we don't have leaders on these boards where these decisions are made. All day. We shut down the whole dental community yeah, while yeah. the medical community is still allowed to be open and things like yep. that. I mean, we have to start yeah. from the top down. Like this should outrage you. And what it does is it just perpetuates the fact that we're being treated like this, what do they say, the child, you know, the stepchild over here, you know what I mean? Yep. And so it's like, I just think this is an opportunity that if, if dental practice owners, dental hygienists, dental teams can really 
uh, adhere and buy in and really present in a manner. I think it can really elevate our profession in a way yeah. that would have us shine and allow us to be taken more seriously in certain arenas. And, and I think Martel was uh, kind of alluding to something that regarding social media. Um, and I wanted to, to, to say that this is the opportunity for practice owners and dental, uh, dental health care pro pro providers to communicate how we, in, how we in dentistry are opening or how are we providing safety to the public. Mm -hmm. Again, that's, that's key. All, all this goes back to communication. Perception is reality for most people, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, whether it's been vetted or not, what they see is what they believe is to be true. So it's, it's very easy for us to, to craft a narrative as to how it's safe or how practices and uh, the uh, dental health or health practices or businesses are making sure that the environment is safe. Right. Um, we have to do that. Mm -hmm. That's our duty and our responsibility. We have to do that. We can't rely on uh, what a CDC uh, dental uh, office is going to put something out or the ADA is going to put something out in the public. Yeah, they will. But again, we, we're, we are the ones that have that unique relationship mm -hmm. with our customers, our patients, uh, people that rely on us to be their oral health consultant in many different ways. And, I, and that's why I'm so glad that Dr. Cook, offices like Dr. Cook are actually calling the patient. Yes, yes, yes. Speaking to the patients. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that I remember I used to teach my residents all the time. Every encounter you have with someone who comes in and, and is entrusting you with their oral health care, they come in and they're receiving some type of treatment. You should be calling them that evening to say, hey, Ms. Jones, how you doing? This is Dr. Hayes. Just following up, seeing how you're doing after that filming we did on the upper right-hand side. How you doing? First of all, they're going to be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> that you called, that the doctor called, or someone from the office called, because that never happens. Number two, if they, if they did have a problem, they don't have much of a problem now because they ha you have demonstrated to them that you care. And if they did uh, have something, it's not, as, not a big deal because the big deal is you called, you demonstrated mm -hmm. that you care, right? And also it builds that trust and that relationship that you have with those folks, again, that are entrusting uh, in you their oral health care. So that mm -hmm. communication about what's happening mm -hmm. in your office or in the place that they call a dental home, mm -hmm. the place that they call a dental home is key. So, you know, in addition to Dr. Cook, other colleagues, I've said the same thing. You need to be calling your patients just to say, you know, let them know that you care about them and how you go about doing that is up to you, but there should be some type of communication so that they know that they care, that you care, and if they do have some dental emergencies that you are on the front of the curve instead of receiving a call at <laughs> right. you know, six o'clock on a Saturday and it's like, oh, I got to yeah. ask Miss Jones again. Here she go again. No, right. get in front of the call and call her and, along with all the other patients and ask them how they're doing during this time. And that's an opportunity to you, for you to continue to build the trust that you have with them, but also it's an opportunity for you to share What's going on in your office? If you haven't already sent an email or a letter, uh, 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 an email blast out to everybody, but now you're asking, Miss Jones, how are you? Any dental things going on? Then you can set up maybe an appointment for teledentistry if you're not open in the office right now or you're transitioning opening. And again, you're just building that relationship and that, which is going to lead to you sharing with those people, your customers, your plan for opening up. And then they'll see the safety. They'll see uh, that there's no fear, mm -hmm. um, but there's a, a, a plan of action so that when it is time, they're ready to come in and there's no hesitancy. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm just, just this whole notion about communication uh, is so key on many different levels, mm -hmm. uh, not only on the regulatory levels, but also the people that, that we serve in dentistry. Yeah.
Yeah, definitely a good idea just from a risk management standpoint, too, to communicate with your patients. Lay it all out on the protocols that you guys are putting in place so that it can squash all those anxieties and fears. And, you know, um, using social media is great. You just you do want to be careful with the type of pictures that are going up there. Um, you need to be mindful, like if you're going to be implementing, you want to share, like, let's say, because there's some practices that have really great social media following, right? right? And they utilize this for part of their marketing. And so you do want to be careful with the type of pictures. If you're taking pictures of your practice or your team in your gear, your PPE and everything, be mindful of that just because um, some of that, those pictures of actual people or providers and things like that you have yeah. to be mindful of like if there's a patient in the picture or any protected health information yeah. can't do that yeah. but then the other thing is you do want to be mindful if you're taking pictures of with yourself in ppe because god forbid if a case were to come like a malpractice or anything that's where a lot of the defense um, or the plaintiffs, their attorneys will go right to the social media and they'll pull those pictures and they'll use them as evidence. So if you, it is very um, common for if you're being sued for some other type of thing like periodontal disease or misdiagnosis or something, they will go to your social media. They will pull if they see anything as far as infection control breaches and then they'll add that in. So it's you do definitely want to um, communicate a couple of practices that I thought was, they did excellent. They took, they got these uh, professional graphics done and they're pretty cool. They're like icons and all those infographics is what it is. And it literally depicted every single protocol that they're going to put in place. It didn't have the actual office. It didn't have, you know, anybody in there, but it was such a good infographic and they've been posting them every day, all throughout the day. And they're just going through their whole protocol of what they're going to be doing so that those that follow them on social media, because that's their communication tool with them, they know what's going to happen when they walk in. So it's not just going to be this like, oh my God, I don't want to do that. Because somebody, one of my clients told me that she had a patient refuse to do part of the protocol because I don't know if there was a lot of communication beforehand, but the patient told her, I'm not doing it because you didn't tell me before I came in that I was going to have to do this. And I wanted to research this. Um, it was, it had to do with the rinse, the pre-rinse. Yes. The patient didn't want to do it because the, the clinician didn't, the practice didn't inform her ahead of her appointment. Uh, what it was all about because she wanted to do her own research to see if it was legitimate and to right. see if it's really so there are those patients out there we have educated consumers now guys oh yeah <laughs> got some educated consumer doctors too yeah. <laughs> right 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 so you know people want to know what you're going to do especially when it has to do with change because people we're human beings human beings do not like change right and so something this is they're walking into a completely different environment than they did eight weeks ago. And so communication is key with your spot on Dr. Darwin. Communication is key with your patients so that they feel comfortable and that they're willing to do all everything that you want them to do to help them stay safe while you're delivering care and help you stay safe while you're delivering care. So well, I think that, um, to add to that, one of the things that I did, you know, we, we all pretty much have a digital footprint with our practices, but the one-on-one -on -one call sends a different message. And doing a videotape, the one that I'm going to do, I'm not going to have on a jacket. I'm not going to be at the office. I'm probably going to be somewhere here at my house. I want it to be kind of informal, kind of the way the Martell looks, comfortable in your home, you know, mm -hmm. and having a conversation, but then laying all those things out that that what to expect to include the mouth rinse because you know that's another thing we didn't talk about you know there's a uh, some research that's saying chlorhexidine is good and others that are saying uh, peroxyl um so you know we have both because we already had chlorhexidine but we went on and ordered the colgate um you know peroxyl so because it's what people are expecting if they've been listening to what's being recommended if they're doing the research we got to make sure that we mirror those things that they're doing mm -hmm. but the other thing that i did uh, after watching a webinar this past week um was i interviewed patients in both practices i came up with the top 10 to 12 patients in both practices i called them and i you know had a hey 
how you doing kind of conversation with them. And um, they appreciated it, one. And two, I asked five questions and I logged the answers to those five questions. And that gave me some insights as to what they're thinking, what they're expecting, what they need to feel safe. What are their thoughts about returning, you know, coming back to the dental office? And I was surprised with some of the answers that I found. And it helped me to tweak some of the content for the video that I'm making. So that I think that that talking to your patients not only shows them that you care, but you can learn from them what they need from you to create a safe environment because we do want them to come back. We do want them to feel comfortable. And as much as we can engage them in this process, just like the team, it, it, it's helpful um, in creating, uh, because the, the patients that have been with you, they, they trust you. And, and if they really think a lot of you, they just believe that you're gonna do the right thing. And all they want is to know what you're doing. All you really gotta do is just lay it out. Yeah. If, if we yeah. just, if we just strive to make a 100 on that test, like just make sure we got <laughs> every check, every block, right? Mm -hmm. And that we have access to, like Dr. Hayes said, at least seven days worth of the PPE. I've already started stockpiling. My stuff was back ordered before I left. But now that we are limited to three boxes of, of uh, masks per week, I put myself on a standing order. Okay, let me have my three. Yeah. <laughs> so right, exactly. So I can build up my reserve because that was another challenge before closing. That was the first time I felt like I was going to run out. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and that's, that scared me more than anything else because I said, well, that's a definite door close because if we can't get it. Yeah, I, I like, think one resource that can be utilized and it's not necessarily the resource, but it's a resource is you have to look at what the membership organizations are doing, right? Mm -hmm. You have to look at what uh, the ADA or the NDA or uh, AAWD, which is the American Association of Women Dentists. Mm -hmm. you look at what ADHA is is put out as putting out for its members, who are, of course, practitioners, and seeing if there is a uh, similar type of uh, uh, social media campaigns or messages that are being utilized that you can tag on with or you or you utilize to strengthen that particular message. But like Martel said, uh, it's one, it's one, it's one resource. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the governing body re of all resources. Um, but I, I think you can look at that as, as a resource, as a guideline to kind of frame how it fits, how that communication fits your practice or your uh, way of wanting to communicate to your, to your public. Yeah, it 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 would be good too to figure out like what's the message that you want, or what you know for your brand, you know, and then kind of figuring out. Okay, so we and then and then creating like a they call it a social media calendar where this week we're going to focus on PPE mm -hmm. or this week we're going to focus on. Uh, um, the triage, what that looks like when a patient first comes into the office. Next week, we're going to focus on this is what it would look like if, you know, when you come for your appointment and things like that, you know, um, and just kind of coming up with a plan, having a solid message throughout that your goal sounds like you, you're just from you chatting on here that you're really focused on public health, patient health, you know, safety, things like that. So coming up with something for, you know, this month we're going to be talking all about safety or whatever. So everything kind of is under that umbrella. Yeah. Um, and, and then, you know. I was mm -hmm. just going to say, and I think for us as oral health practitioners, um, both as hygienists and dentists, we're real particular, right, about things to the point where <laughs> we get in our, we get in our own, uh, our, our own way as relates to having something, something must be done to this precise uh, uh, step <laughs> to the point where if it's not like this, I'm not gonna release it or I'm not yeah. gonna mm -hmm. I will tell you that will hinder uh, what you're doing. And some of it will be kind of like a learning process, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, what, what you're trying to do is inform. You're trying to be mm -hmm. a resource for your, your patients and for those that, uh, that, that and trust you with their oral health. So just like you said, Dr. Cook, you know, make, keeping it in a real relaxed, comfortable environment. Um, and you're just, 
you're basically just having a conversation with those mm -hmm. that, that love you, that love your office, and you're just sharing information. Remember, it's a dental home, so it should be warm, it should be inviting, it should be uh, uh, natural. You know, people pick up on all of that stuff mm -hmm. as you are talking to them and communicating with them. And, um, but at the same time, don't try to, I would say, don't try to be so uh, A-type personality that we all are in, in trying to produce it because you'll always find something that can be done better and then you end up not <laughs> releasing it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. Yeah. Well, I think that timing um, one of the things that I, one of the webinars I watched this week, it, it, it spoke to that, that this is the time you have to do it now. Oh yes. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Definitely now. Definitely now. And Everybody's the, watching. Everybody's well, watching and waiting. Everything from my, my best friend lives in Atlanta. Um, her dentist has the same voicemail they had before all this happened. They haven't even changed the oh. voice. So, and I would say <laughs> those are the, just those small things, change your voicemail. You know, uh, just and on the voicemail, it could say, uh, we'll be sending information out, uh, you know, soon or something, but say something. And right. it doesn't even have to be the whole answer, but just to speak to it um, and, and to do it now. Um, I think that you're right. Sometimes we wrestle with, you know, it's got to be perfect. You got to do this, that. Um, I, after interviewing my patients, I was like, well, I'm going to speed my timeline up. We went on and sent another letter. I mean, we'd already sent, we've changed the voicemail. We'd already sent one letter. Um, we had Good. sent some text messages weeks ago, but then we updated, sent a new letter out yesterday and the day before Thursday and Friday, the letters went out. And so coming up this week will be, the video will be up and we'll send a, a mass text message and another email that says, hey, take a look at the video. Um, and that way for the practices that are not opening, people will appreciate because people were asking us why, well, why is your office closed? The governor opened the state back up. They ridiculed us. Mm -hmm. And it, it, and they, they ridiculed us. And I said, well, one, we got to make sure we got enough PPE. You know, I just gave a, 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 an answer. It wasn't lengthy, but people need to understand why we're not open, why we're choosing to wait and how important it is for us to, to choose safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we just wanted to, um, any takeaways from anyone watching? Um, I know we hit on, you know, social, uh, social media, PPE. Um, some insurances are reimbursing for PPE. Um, some are not. Um, can patients be charged for it? <laughs> I know I just saw a webinar with India. Like, can we just charge people just because we have these? <laughs> we we have the fee, so now you got to pay the fee. <laughs> I that's mean, a, that's a whole nother discussion. That's, that's a whole, whole nother uh, podcast or right, right, okay. right, right, right. So yeah, so any takeaways um, that you guys have? Any messages that you want to send to your patients or anyone watching? I, I I'll, I'll kick it off I, again. Communication is key. Communication is key. You have to have some t modality of communication to your to your patients, but also more importantly to your staff and your team, um, so that everyone's on the same page. Uh, team does stand for every uh, together. Everyone achieves more, and that means input uh, and and everything else. Uh, communication is is key, and also keeping in mind uh, public health safety, the safety of of uh, of your patients that are coming in, but also you and your staff uh, as health as a healthcare provider uh, and practice. I think one of the key takeaways is I just want to encourage everybody just to be patient. <laughs> uh, you know, be understanding. Everybody's coming into the practice um, with in a different headspace. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. Everybody's got different skin in the game. Try to be patient with your team. Try to be patient with, uh, you know, if you are a team member, be patient with, the, you know, your employer, your practice owner, and uh, really just educate yourself. Go to the CDC, go to your dental board, and go to OSHA. Those are the three that I'm recommending. Stay focused on those nobody else. <laughs> and maybe that'll help you kind of navigate a little bit more uh, so that you'll feel more confident and equipped when you do re-enter and come back to work. I probably would add to breathe. Before you re-engage this process, take a breath. 
and um, be confident in your ability to process information intelligently, learn for yourself what you need to know, um, include your team, ask them what they're thinking, invite them to the table with you. Whether you're the team leader or you're or on the team, invite people to come to that space and discuss with you what's happening, not just before you go or not just the first week, but on a continued basis. And in addition to the list that India just, um, just presented, also check with your malpractice insurance. Um, make sure that the things that you're doing or going to embark upon uh, will be covered. Um, when we reopen, we're not going to the full scope of practice. We're going to do emergencies only. Um, we're going to focus on that vulnerable population that we've had to put on pause. And so I would say just kind of prioritize, take it one step at a time. And just like you had, you know, a great practice before you'll come back to one. And if you didn't, this is your chance. It's a do-over. This is a chance for you to start fresh. This is a chance for you to implement things that maybe you thought about doing before, but now you can, you can take it slow. And uh, you, this is an opportunity to start over um, and just, you know, be safe, do your best. People are looking, they're looking to you to do your best. Okay, so again, um, thank you everyone for being on this panel. You guys are you guys are great. Um, I always enjoy seeing you, Dr. Cook. We need to know where where you're located. <laughs> That's number four. <laughs> That's number four. <laughs> we need a we need a dental home. Um, but yeah, no, thank thank you guys. Um, we are going to be posting this on YouTube, so if you are watching, don't forget to subscribe. Um, we'll put everyone's Instagram, social media, and websites in the comments. Um, thank you guys again. That's Bye, it. guys. Bye.